Chapter Four of The Secret of the Ninth Planet, Version Two by Donald Walheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Four: The Hidden Skyport. Around the table there was a concerted sigh. Burl, his ears still throbbing from his sudden excitement, realized each of them had been holding his breath. General Shrove smiled and glanced at the elder Denning, who sat expressionless. It is not an easy thing for him, Burl thought. At that moment, Burl knew that he had come of age. This moment of decision, coming truly and literally like a bolt out of the blue, had thrust him into man's estate before his time. He would show that he was able to carry this burden. Shrove now spoke to Lockhart. Colonel, we are holding you to your schedule. According to it, you can take off in five more days. Will you need any more time because of this addition to your crew? The stocky air veteran shook his head. Not at all. We'll be loaded and ready on the hour I set. I'll take Denning in hand and brief him on what he may need to know. Actually, we may even be able to get him a home leave. After all, his duties won't begin until actual planet falls are made. They rose from their seats. Burl stood up, uncertain as to procedure, but Lockhart came over to him and took his arm. Burl, we're going to have to give you a rundown on the ship and the plans. We've no time to waste if you want to get a chance to say goodbye to your folks later on. I understand, said Burl. He turned and waved to his father, who was in conversation with the general. I'll see you at home in a few days, Dad, he called, then followed Lockhart out. Outside the building they were joined by several other members of the conference and immediately ringed about by a squad of Air Force men wearing sidearms. Burl realized that they were to be thus guarded everywhere they went. Obviously, the possibility that the builders of the sun traps might have agents operating on Earth had occurred to the officers. Russell Clyde, the young astronomer, was among their group. He walked over to Burl and shoved out a hand. Glad to have you with us, Burl. This is going to be quite a trip. Clyde was about Burl's size. He had an engagingly boyish air about him, and Burl took a liking to him. Burl had heard of him before. For the young man, while still a college student, had formulated a remarkable new theory of the composition of galactic formations which had instantly focused the attention of the scientific world upon him. This theory had been taken up by the greybeards of the scientific world and had survived the test of their debates. Now associated with the great Mount Palomar Observatory, Russell Clyde had continued to build a reputation in astronomical circles. "'You're one of the expedition, then?' asked Burl, shaking his hand. The redhead nodded. "'Yep. They're taking me as their chief astrogator. And don't think it's because I'm any great shakes at it, either. It's just that I'm still young enough to take the kind of shoving around these high brass figure we're going to get. Boy, have they got it figured.' Burl chuckled. "'Ah, you're kidding, Dr. Clyde. You've probably been in on this from the beginning.' The other shook his head vigorously. Nope, it was going to be Merkman's baby, but when they realize they have a fight on their hands, they always look for young blood. And say, cut out this doctor stuff. Call me Russ. We're going to share quarters, you know. How do you know that? asked the tall, rather sharp-figured man who had overheard them. The colonel will assign quarters. I say he will, and you can bet on that, snapped Russell Clyde. He waved a hand in introduction. This is Harvey Caton, one of our electronics wizards. Caton nodded, but before he could continue the discussion, Lockhart rounded them all up and packed them into a couple of station wagons, guards and all, and they were off. The next days were hectic ones. By car and plane the group was transferred to the large, closely guarded base in Wyoming where the secret anti-gravity ship was waiting. Burl did not see this ship right away. First he was introduced to all the other members of the crew, had given a mass of papers to study which outlined the basic means of the new space drive and which detailed the opinions and suggestions of various experts as to methods of procedure and courses of action. He was subjected to various space medical tests to determine his reactions under differing pressures and gravities. Although it proved a strenuous and exhausting routine, he emerged from the test with flying colors. The expedition was commanded as he had known by Colonel Lockhart, who would also act as chief pilot. The famous military flyer proved to be a forceful personality with a great skill at handling people. 
he knew how to get the most out of each man. Russell Clyde was the chief astrogator and astronomical expert. Assisting him was the rather pedantic and sober Samuel Oberfield, a mathematical wizard and astrophysicist, on leave from an assistant professorship at one of the great universities. Clyde and Oberfield would also act as co-pilots relieving Lockhart. Harvey Catton, blonde Jurgen Detmar, and the jovial Frank Shea were the three men engineering crew. Completing the members of the expedition was another trio chosen to act as general crew, medical and commissary men while in flight, and as a trained explorer fighter unit while on planet side. Roy Haynes, of whose exploits in Africa and the jungles of South America Burl Denning had heard, was the first of these, a rugged, weather-beaten but astonishingly alert explorer. Captain Edgar Bolton, on leave from the United States Marines, was the second, a man who had made an impressive record in various combat actions in his country's service. The Antarctic explorer Leon Ferretti completed the listing. Ferretti was an expert on getting along in conditions of extreme frigidity and hostile climates. Of these men, only Lockhart, Clyde, Detmar, and Ferretti had had space experience in the platforms and in moon rocketry. It was still, thought Burl, a large crew for a spaceship. No rocket built to date had ever been able to carry such a load. But by then he had realized that the strict weight limitation imposed by rocket fuels no longer applied to this new method of space flight. Burl found himself more and more anxious to see this wonderful craft. It was not until the morning of the second day that Burl's chance came. He had fallen asleep on the stiff army cot in the hastily improvised base on the Wyoming prairie where the final work was being done. The day had been a confused jumble of impressions with little time to catch his breath. Now he had slept the sleep of exhaustion only to be awakened at dawn by Lockhart. Up and dress, the colonel greeted him. We're taking you out to look the ship over. Detmar will come along and explain the drive. Burl threw his clothes on, gulped down breakfast in the company of the others at the mess hall, and soon was speeding along a wide new road that ran up the mountains edging the wide western plain. As they neared the mountains he saw a high wooden wall blocking the road in view. This was the barrier that concealed the ship nestled in the valley beyond. They passed the guard's scrutiny and emerged into the valley. The AG-17 loomed suddenly above them, and Burl's first impression was of a glistening metal fountain roaring up from the ground, gathering itself high in the sky, as if to plunge down again in a rain of shining steel. The ship was like a huge, gleaming raindrop. It stood two hundred feet high, the wide, rounded, blunt bulk of it high in the air, as if about to fall upward instead of downward. It tapered down to a trim, perfectly streamlined point which touched the ground. It was held upright by a great cradle of girders and beams. At various points the polished steel was broken by indentations or inset round dots that were thick portholes or indications of entry ports. Around its equator, girding the widest section, was a ring of portholes, and there were scattered rings of similar portholes below this. As the three men drew near the tail, the great bulk loomed overhead, and Burl felt as if its weight were bearing down on him as they walked beneath. Two men were suspended from the scaffolding above. Burl twisted his neck and saw that the designation AG-17 and the white star insignia of the United States had been lettered along the sides. But what was it the men were painting now? It will read Magellan, said Lockhart, following Burl's eyes. We decided that that would be the appropriate name for it. For what we are going to have to do with it is not just make a simple trip to explore another planet, but to circumnavigate the entire solar system. Burl found his eyes dazzled by the vessel, hanging like a giant bulbous mushroom over them. Around him he began to realize that a number of other activities were going on. There were spidery scaffolds leading up to open ports in the metallic sides. Workmen were raising loads of material into these ports, and for an instant Burl caught sight of Haynes in rough work clothes shouting orders from one of the openings as to exactly where to stow something. At last he took his eyes away from the startling sight. The little valley around him had a number of low storage shacks. A road led in from another pass through the mountains. Two loaded trucks came down this pass now in low gear. 
Lockhart, watching, remarked, We are having our equipment and supplies flown up to a town twenty miles away, and then trucked in. Why didn't you leave this ship where it was built, in your plant in Indiana, and load it from there? Burl asked. It would have been easier, said the colonel, but security thought it better to transfer the craft to its launching site up here in these deserted hills. We are going to make our takeoff from here because we are still too experimental to know what might happen if something kicked up or if the engines failed. We'd hate to splatter all over a highly populated industrial area. Besides, you must know if you looked over those papers yesterday that there's a lot of radioactive stuff here. Burl nodded. Detmar cut in. Why don't we get aboard and show him over the ship? It will be easier to make it clear that way. Suiting action to the word, the three went over to one of the loading platforms, climbed on the wiry little elevator, and were hoisted up fifty feet to the port in the side of the ship. They entered well below the vast overhanging equatorial bulge which marked the wide end of the teardrop-shaped vessel. They walked through a narrow plastic-walled passage, broken in several places by tight round doors bearing storage number vaults. At the end of the passage they came to a double-walled metal airlock. They stepped through and found themselves in what was evidently the living quarters of the spaceship. The Magellan was an entirely revolutionary design as far as space vehicles were concerned. Its odd shape was no mere whimsy, but a practical model. If a better design were to be invented, it would only come out of the practical experiences of this first great flight. It had long been known, ever since Einstein's early equations, that there was a kinship between electricity, magnetism, and gravitation. In electricity and magnetism there were both negative and positive fields manifesting themselves in the form of attraction and repulsion. These opposing characteristics were the basis for man's mastery of electrical machinery. But for gravitation there had seemed at first no means of manipulating it. As it was to develop, this was due to two factors. First, the Earth itself possessed a gravitational phenomenon in this force outside of that intense, all-prevailing field. Second, to overcome this primal force required the application of energy on such scales as could not be found outside of the mastery of nuclear energy. There was a simple parallel, Burl had been told the day before by Sam Oberfield in the history of aviation. A practical propeller-driven flying machine could not be constructed until a motor had been invented that was compact, light, and powerful enough to operate it. So all efforts to make such machines prior to the development of the internal combustion engine in the first days of the twentieth century were doomed to failure. Likewise, in this new instance, a machine to utilize gravitation could not be built until a source of power was developed having the capacity to run it. Such power was found only in the successful harnessing of the hydrogen disintegration explosion, the H-bomb force. The first success at channeling this nuclear power in a non-bomb device had been accomplished in England in 1958. The Zeta ring generator had been perfected in the next decade. Only this source of harnessed atomic power could supply the force necessary to drive an AG ship. The nose of the Magellan housed an H-power stellar generator. Within the bulk of the top third of the ship was this massive power source, its atomic components, its uranium-hydrogen fuel, and the beam that channeled the gravitational drive. Negating gravity is not a simple matter like inventing a magic sheet of metal that cuts off the pull of the earth, such as H. G. Wells wrote about, Overfield had explained. That is impossible because it ignores all the other laws of nature. It forgets the power of inertia. It denies the facts of mass and gravity. It takes just as much energy to lift an anti-gravity ship as to lift a rocket ship. The difference is only in the practicality of the power source. A rocket ship must burn its fuel by chemical explosion in order to push its cargo load upward. Its fuel is limited by its own weight and by the awkwardness of its handling. This AG ship also must supply energy foot-pound for foot-pound, for every foot it raises the vehicle. But due to the amount of energy supplied by this new nuclear generator, such power is at last available, in one compact form, and in such concentration that this ship could propel itself for hundreds of years.
he went on to explain that what then happened was that the vessel, exerting a tremendous counter-gravitational force, literally pushed itself up against the Earth's drive. At the same time, this force could be used to intensify the gravitational pull of some other celestial body. The vessel would begin to fall toward that other body and be repelled from the first body, Earth in this case. As every star, planet, and satellite in the universe was exerting a pull on every other one, the anti-gravity spaceship literally reached out, grasped hold of the desired gravitational rope hanging down from the sky, and pulled itself up it. It would seem to fall upward into the sky. It could increase or decrease the effect of its fall. It could fall free toward some other world, or it could force an acceleration in its fall by adding repulsion from the world it was leaving. In flight, therefore, the wide nose was the front. It would fall through space pulled by the power beam generated from this front. The rear of the spaceship was the tapering small end. As Burl was shown over the living quarters, it became plain to him that the actual living spaces in the Magellan were inside a metal sphere hanging on gimbals below the equatorial bulge that housed the power drive. The bulk of this sphere was always well within the outer walls of the teardrop and thus protected from radiation. Being suspended on gimbals, the sphere would rotate so that the floor of the living quarters was always downward to wherever the greatest pull of gravity might happen to be. Burl and the others explored the three floors that divided the inner sphere, all oriented toward Earth. The central floor, housing the sleeping quarters and living quarters, was compact but roomier than might have been expected. There were five bunk rooms, each shared by two men. There was a main living and dining room. On the lowermost floor was the cook room, a small dispensary, and immediate supplies. On the upper floor was the control room, with its charts and television view plates, which allowed vision in all directions from sending plates fixed on the surface in various areas. In the spaces between the inner sphere and the outer shell were the basic storage areas. Here supplies and equipment were being stocked against all possible emergencies. In the tapering space of the tail below the sphere was a rocket launching tube. Stored in the outer shells were various vehicles for planetary exploration. Haynes came into the control room where the three were standing. He was wiping his hands on a piece of cloth and looked tired. Finally got the special sealed engine jeep stowed away, he said. I was afraid we weren't going to get it in time. The moon base people had ordered it, and they're going to holler bloody murder when they find out we appropriated it. Lockhart shrugged. Let him yell. It'll be too late when they find out. How much longer will we need before you finish the loading? Haynes drew up a chair to a chart table and sat down. I expect to get some more stuff tomorrow, and then the two-man rocket plane the next day. We already have the four-man rocket aboard. That'll do it. The rest of your men ready? Lockhart nodded. We're just about set. Denning here can take a quick trip home tomorrow and will be ready the day after. Burl looked about him quickly. One day, two days, maybe a third, and then the plunge into the unknown. Detmar reached upward and drew down a metal ladder, hanging in the curved ceiling of the chamber. I'm going to take a look in the engine room, he said. Want to come along? he asked Burl. Before the young man could say yes, Lockhart shook his head. No, I don't want him to. I don't want anyone going up there who doesn't have to. That stuff is shielded, but you can never be sure. Burl was disappointed, for he had wanted to see the nuclear generators. But Detmar shook his head, smiled, and pushed aside a round trap door in the ceiling. Burl could see that it connected with a similar door a foot higher. Detmar pushed it open and ascended into the forbidden sphere of the Zeta rings. Burl got a glimpse of subdued bluish light, and then the trap door shut after the engineer. Later, as they drove out through the valley, Burl looked back at the huge ship, and now, instead of appearing like an overhanging metal waterfall, he saw it as a wide-nosed bullet aiming at the sky, surging against its bonds, a bullet for humanity's sake. End of chapter 4 Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks.com